All I have to say is thank you for all your love and support. You guys follow what I do, and, you know, I don't know. You guys are rad, so I appreciate it. Oh, well, hey, man, I appreciate you saying that, but, uh, you know, the, the honor is all mine, really. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> go back and forth that way. What's up, guys? Frank here with the godfather of Devil Bass, the Cuban speed demon, and one of my biggest influences on drums, the one and only legendary drummer, Dave Lombardo, about to release his solo album. Uh, Dave, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to kill some time with you today. And uh, I know you're a busy man and have so many things going on this year, including, you know, Testament, Mr. Bungle, The Misfits, to name a few. I mean, with so many sets and songs to learn, how much time do you actually spend on that process? You know, the learning and writing and rehearsing. Um, well, right now I have a Bungle tour coming up uh, May. I think, I think rehearsals start... Um, I think May 6th or May 5th. So I have, I have about two or three weeks. So what I'll do is I'll start listening to the set list, you know, uh, daily. Uh, I need to focus on one particular song that we're, uh, that we're going to play on this upcoming tour. And, um, you know, so I need to map that song out, you know, possibly make some notes and, um, you know, the rehearsals get, you know, pretty insane because they don't just, you know, begin at rehearsal with the band. You know, it starts weeks prior to me getting together with the band. You know, I sit with the music and listen and, uh, you know, play on my practice pad, do a lot of, you know, visual visualization, you know, watching myself play on stage or playing the actual drums and visualizing myself um playing the parts and and then when i get behind the kit with the band it's uh it's all instinctual it's like oh i've done this before um right. you know little details here and there we got to work on getting uh getting the music tight and uh you know all the breaks and the changes uh that we those those are things you do with the band and then um and then after that uh you know, you just uh, make sure that the speed and the tempo is there, you know, make sure it's aggressive. You know, I, I always, uh, I have a saying, I, I think drumming is 70% mental, 30% physical. I don't know if you feel that I agree. Way. I agree. There's a lot that I do that starts, uh, you know, in the mind, uh, you know, the counting, uh, um, you know, the changes. Um I mean, after you've played for a while, after you're really comfortable behind the drum set, you could then limit the amount of time behind the drum kit um, and, uh, you know, think about the parts more. And, you know, that way, when you do get together with a band, you're not burned out or, or anything like that. You know, everything is still fresh. But yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, the world does know you as one of the greatest metal drummers out there, but your your new album really runs the gamut with percussion from really all areas of, you know, the planet. Uh, you have some Asian stuff, uh, Hispanic stuff in there. Can you take us through the process of putting Rice of Passage together? You know, like when percussion. you were, sorry, Rice of Percussion. Yeah. <laughs> Keep doing that. Rice of Percussion together. When, when you were writing the album, did you compose the, you know, the certain, with certain sounds in mind, or was it kind of like, uh, you laid everything out on a table and, and tried different things? Um, I think there might be, you know, two answers to that question, the way the album sounds and how it evolved, that is a freak of nature. I, I don't know how it's almost magical when you're creating an album, you know, you, you don't know, you know what the band sounds like, you know what the instruments sound like, but then once the music is mixed and processed to your, to your taste and, and, and uh, to what you you want to hear, uh, it takes on a life of its own. It morphs into a cohesive unit. Uh, and, but the, the instruments I was, you know, very uh, particular on what I chose um, because, again, I, I didn't know the, you know, what it was going to end up like. 
it was all experimentation. This is all just a vision that I've had in my in my mind for years, and it finally came together. And I wasn't I was shocked. And what I usually do is like I'll pick an instrument, and it's like if I have a rhythm, you know, floating around in my head, you know, it's like okay, I want to create something like this, you know, and I'll lay down that track, uh, just one track of that one instrument and then i started layering another instrument on top of that until i have this you know this piece of music and then i go in there and i edit and i move you know let's say certain parts around or i'll uh you know tune some of the instruments i'll pitch them not only tune them you know as a, a physical instrument i'll tune them just like my drum kits. Uh, but sometimes I have to go extreme, do extreme measures and tune them within uh, the recording process. Uh, so I just have to make sure that everything, when I create a piece, it, uh, it blends well, you know, they, they connect right. and there's a, there's a harmony with them within the instruments you know you can find harmony in, in all kinds of things it's not just string instruments and you know call me crazy but i hear harmonies and drums so uh i mean art blakey heard violins and his cymbals so i can hear harmonies in my drums you know? <laughs> so uh yeah that's that's pretty much it i mean it was it's a lot of fun i love that you said that because i i, I do agree you know like what I love about the album is that it showcases the fact that drums and percussion could be musical instruments on their own. And it doesn't, you know, you don't have to rely on a, a voice, a guitar, a synth to make those, uh, you know, to make music really, um, right. you know, and, and with such a, a big career and playing in heavy bands though, those, did you find those lack of elements to be a new challenge to write with? Uh, no, because, in my mind, when I think these these patterns and you know think of these patterns and these ideas and um, they're already floating around in my head without you know string instruments um, or I should say you know uh, yeah yeah string instruments guitars bass you know um, I don't always think in metal instrumentation I don't always think in uh, any kind of traditional uh, instrumentation. Sometimes I'm way out in left field, and, and you know the sound of a uh, of a dump truck going by. You know, sometimes will inspire you know some kind of rhythmic or sound. It's like wow, you know, I'll hear something. It's like oh man, I wish I had my recorder to to get a hold of that sound and sample it somehow. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's it comes from everywhere. I do remember. I mean, I've been following your career since I was, you know, a kid, and and I remember uh, around in the '90s, you were one of the first drummers I knew to to use like the Elisis DM5 or DM4 or whatever it was. And yeah, yeah. you know, you you were always kind of that that dude at the forefront of experimentation with drums. I mean, do you is that something that you actively work on, like like try to find all the gadgets and sounds and and do um, something? Yeah, especially, I mean, during that time, uh, I remember when I left Slayer uh, in 92, uh, well, it was like close to 91, right before I left, I I got into industrial music. And while everyone was into their grunge and, you know, new metal at that time, uh, I I took a complete left and got into industrial music, got into KMFDM, Lords of Acid, uh, you know, Leibach, uh, Pig Face, uh, you know, Nine Inch Nails, you know, so many different bands at that time. And, you know, because I felt like I was under a rock and under this, this, I was in this cave and I hadn't heard or seen any other kind of music, only metal at that time. So that was it's what inspired me to use those modules, uh, which was short lived. I, I was I wasn't into the DM five. That one I I used uh, to trigger some sounds 
off of uh off of the first grip incorporated album and then i started dabbling with triggers and i didn't like that that was just that's like cgi for drums you know it's just not real and um uh, and so yeah that's as far as i i went with that but i i do try i don't i don't keep myself in the closet you know and, and just stay in there and isolate myself with what i learned when i was you know a teenager uh you know i always tried to learn new software uh new recording methods um and and so forth always staying fresh and yes on the cutting edge you mentioned you know in uh you know the the time of slayer that you were kind of locked in this closet of metal um which begs the question i mean coming from a, a cuban family how did you get into metal in the first place uh, my love for, for rock music, you know, I had my mom and dad, they would play, you know, Cuban music in the house, but my two older brothers, my oldest brother was into R and B. He was into Chaka Khan, Tina Turner, uh, you know, war, Sly and the family stone, etc. Uh, and, uh, my second older brother, oldest brother, he, uh, Danny, he, he was into uh, Cream, uh, Zeppelin, um, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix. He was totally opposite. So I had this, all this music. So I was left with, uh, with the ability to venture out and discover my own music, which I, I did through radio. Uh, and there was a record store down the street from my house in Southgate where uh, I would buy 45s. And uh, whenever I would hear a song on on the radio or he heard a song, you know, at a party that my mom and dad would go to, because uh, we would have these like family parties at other Cuban people's houses and stuff. And uh, so if I heard something there, you know, from a band playing or, or whatever, I would take the name down, go to the record store and buy it. Uh, I did that with uh, the Doobie Brothers, uh, Long Train Running. I did that with Taking Care of Business by Bachman Turner Overdrive. And I also uh, bought Sir Duke by Stevie Wonder. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, some Aretha Franklin songs. And, and so I had, I guess, uh, you know, I had input from my my brothers and 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 my parents and you know and to enjoy different styles of music. But then heavy music for me was like I would always seek out like the heavier songs. It was something about the crunch of a guitar or the speed or the tempo of a song. Uh, I remember there was a there was a song by Zeppelin called the Wonton Song, and I thought that was heavy as fuck, man. And uh, I remember going to my friend's house and say, hey, do you have Zeppelin records? And I tried to look for that song, the Wonton song. And I would see the records that they had. No, no, no. I, I could not find that song until a friend of mine had physical graffiti, another friend, and, and uh, said, there it is. And I turned it on, I put it on the turntable and, and really enjoyed it. And, uh, eventually bought that album. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I got into... Iron Maiden and Judas Priest, you know, Motorhead. And then as history knows, I got into the punk and, you know, the harder, the faster the music, you know, the more it appealed to me. So, I mean, would you say Led Zeppelin was that gateway for you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would have. Yeah, I think so. Zeppelin. Um, I remember buying Purple Haze and Foxy Lady on a 45. You know, you flip it, it's Foxy Lady, and the other one is Purple Haze. Uh, so, yeah, bands like that, you know, Jimmy, even Jimi Hendrix was a, a gateway to yeah. heavier music. You know? uh, but I, I love that you you listen to so much. I mean, like, you know, from Cuban music to rock, metal, industrial, everything. I mean, you are obviously known as a really big inspiration to a lot of drummers out there. Who, who were, you know, your inspiration then and now? Back then, 
Uh, you know, the typical, the Bill Ward, John Bonham, uh, Ginger Baker, uh, Ian Pace, Deep Purple, um, um, geez, uh, Mitch Mitchell with Jimi Hendrix. He had, his playing was just absolute fire. Uh, that was then, then as, you know, time went on, uh, it had to be, you, you couldn't simply just be a good drummer. You know, there were, there were so many that were, that were just great, but the music had to be attached to that drummer. I had to like the music. And, and so I think later I got into, of course, Motorhead, Filthy. His, his drumming, I think, propelled me to, or compelled me to, to discover the double bass and add that to my drum set. Um, you know, of course, Bonham, you know, he was a big influence, but Clive Burr was an amazing influence, uh, amazing drummer. And he was, uh, I liked his, you know, approach and aggression on the drums. He played with fire as well. Um, in the early Iron Maiden albums were influences. Then later I got into the punk the punk movement or the you know not really the punk scene because i was i had long hair uh i did go to a couple you know or a few punk shows but i was a little late to that scene and uh and and i got into gbh uh circle jerks chuck biscuits uh black flag with robo um uh, uh, D.H. Peligro, uh, Dead Kennedys, uh, so many great drummers in those punk bands, um, exploited. Uh, so yeah, it, it just goes on from there. And now, uh, it, it's, it's difficult because, you know, there's a lot of great drummers, great metal drummers out there so many and so many kids online you know showing off their chops and and uh it's uh there's too many to choose from you know <laughs> there's there are so many that's like wow you know i can't back then it was very limited back then being when i was younger you know it was only the few that i was able to discover but then uh with you know with today it's like geez there's uh there is a drummer that's on Instagram that he's experimental. He uses all kinds of weird uh, drum contraption. I think is Arthur Dubois and uh, very unique and very creative and really uh, inspires me to when I create these, uh, when I do sound design in my studio where I'll take a sound and I'll develop it. I'll add reverb, delays, uh, distortion to a drum sound, you know, to make it sound dirty. Um, but he has a different approach. Well, he'll use a bowl of water. He'll hit a cymbal, drop the cymbal in a bowl of water. You know, he has a special contraption on his hi-hat. It's like a bow, like from a, a cello. And he'll have that bow uh, on the inside of a floor tom with his hi-hat somehow controlling the bow and creating this weird sound and he'll play the drum you know play his his uh his setup this custom setup that he's created and he does these video shoots and um he'll he'll do like one a day or one every three days well man that's creative uh daru jones Daru Joan played in a band called 13 and uh, or he still does with Faro Manch and, and Marcus Machado. And it's it's a little it's a bit of uh, like hip hop. But Daru now plays with Jack White. And man, this guy, he has a unique drum setup, which I admire because every drummer today has the same basic drum setup. And uh, it, it almost feels like they all went to the same school. They all learned from the same teacher. And and it's just not inspiring. 
Uh, but Daru has this, this way of playing where it's so laid back, so um, like it, it's not on the beat. He's almost a little late. And uh, I really love that. And it, it inspired some songs that I wrote uh, with my wife uh, on this album that we did, Venomorous, which is a bunch of love ballads. And uh, and so it inspired, you know, one of the songs on there. Uh, and also, um, oh, he plays in Son Luke's uh, Ian Chang. Ian Chang is another uh, innovator you know, creates these drum beats where he's rolling his, uh, the brushes, you know, when you're playing brushes, you can roll the brushes on your floor tom and it creates this weird sound. And, um, and so just looking at these drummers today and how innovative they are, dude, that's, it, it's inspiring and, and I, I enjoy it. You know, you could, you could play metal all day long. It's, I've, I've done that. And you got to be really uh, exceptional um, for me to really, you know, gravitate and get inspired uh, because I've been doing metal for so long. It's like, there's only so much you can do. You know what I mean? I mean, no offense to any of these drummers. They're, they're fantastic. Um, you know, Eloy Casagrande, Jay Weinberg, amazing. Um, you know, so these guys, those guys are, you know, phenomenal as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, like as time goes on, it seems uh, they also seem like they're getting younger and younger. I've seen like five year old kids just like wailing. And I'm like, Jesus, man, like, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah. But uh, I, I have to check out some of those drummers you suggested because some of them sound truly inventive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it would shock you. You'd be like, whoa, man. The way Daru Jones sets up his drums, man, it, it, it's really, really cool. They have a Daru Jones and Faro Manch and Marcus, they have an album called, or a band called 13. And uh, check it out. It's, it's really cool. It's got dark elements, uh, very like creepy kind of vibe, really cool guitar lines. And it's only a trio, vocals, guitar, and drums. As a drummer myself, I know sitting behind a drum set rocking out is very different than playing percussive instruments, you know, the, the way that you meant to, at least. Um, yeah. When did you get into these instruments? You know, I imagine that they had a, a, a part of your upbringing at some point too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a, a set of bongos when I was growing up as a kid, uh, as early as probably third grade, five, six, seven, I might've been eight. I, I performed at in my third to my third grade class. Um, uh, I played along to a Santana record. Uh, I brought the for for show and tell. It was funny. I I was really shy and I didn't want to walk into class with my bongos and my record. So I stayed outside, kind of scared. And uh, the teacher was like, "All right, Dave, you, you better come into class now." <laughs> you know, and uh, went in went to my seat, put my bongos under the table and, uh, and, and, and I had my record with me and, uh, I, I played in front of the class. So percussive instrument has been a big part, obviously of my culture and, and, um, and I've always embraced it, loved it. Um, you know, I've, I've always had congas in the house, bata. I've always had batas in the house. I have like, um, this, several instruments from just laying in my living room. So every time I, you know, go to another part of the house, I'll walk by the drums and I hit them and then I'll just keep walking. <laughs> and then, so, yeah, a bunch of like wood blocks, these weird hand percussions that I have on a counter. Um, so yeah, it's a big part, big part of my life. You've been on a, over a hundred recordings during your career, which is, truly just nuts you know that said do you have like one in particular that you're most proud of your own performance yes rights of percussion <laughs> <laughs> i should have said i should have fucked with you and said rights of passion <laughs> right 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 
Uh, no, the rights of percussion probably has to be, you know, one of them. Uh, there, there's so many others. Um, it's hard to pinpoint one. I'm, I'm proud of all of them because uh, all of them, all of those records and performances, you know, is um, related to a, a period of, in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know, I, it, it's so difficult to pick one, you know, but then if I sat down with my, my catalog and, and I started sharing, let's say if you're sitting in my living room and I start sharing, uh, songs, I'll oh, listen to this one. I'll listen to this one. You'll soon find out, I think, which ones are, are, are like my favorites. You know, I, I kind of gravitate towards Phantomus mm -hmm. because those were the most challenging um, and mind, uh, uh, mind opening uh, uh, musical experiences. Uh, but it, it's hard to just, you know, you know, just nail down one. Is there any that you would want to go back and redo? Nah, no, nah, because they those are like, for example, Show No Mercy. We were young and we didn't know what the fuck we were doing in the studio. Yeah. And neither did the engineer or, you know, the producer, because the music was so fast and so loud. How do we record and capture something like this? And the only person that did it properly was Rick Rubin um, and, and Andy Wallace on the Rain and Blood record. And, and every record thereafter uh, with Slayer. Uh, but I, I wouldn't change it because that is the characteristic that those were the limitations we were faced with at the time. And that's what makes those albums special. So to re-record it, yeah. It's, yeah, no, that makes I sense. Would, yeah. yeah. That's almost like saying you regret something and it's better not to. It's better not to because that whatever it is that you regret got you to where you are now. Mm -hmm. So I think recording those albums the way we did, um, uh, I think, you know, um, helped, I think Rick Rubin and Andy Wallace to, you know, really focus in, focus and hone in the sounds that we weren't able to, to capture in the past um, so better to leave the past alone and just move forward and you know do as best as you can from that point on you know speaking of the past this year marks the 30th anniversary of grip incorporated a band that i'm a huge fan of and you know like the work that you do with Moldemar is is you know something i still listen to and celebrate and in fact one of the coolest shows i saw uh, was you guys opening for Morbid Angel? I think it was like '95 in New York. Yeah, that was, was one of my favorite. That and I think uh, that was uh, a yeah. limelight. Yeah, yeah, I was like 14, 15, and that was the first time I ever met you. My dad, I was like too shy, but my dad's like, "You gotta say hi. It's your favorite drummer." So, real was, was like, I cool? I you're hope. super cool. Yeah. All right, good, good. Because yeah. sometimes people hit me up, and like, as soon as I walk off stage, and I'm just like exhausted mentally, like. My adrenaline is kicked in, and and I, I haven't cooled down yet. So some people will get in front of me, like, "Hey man, how you doing, Dave? You know, get the fuck away from me!" Right, right. And right. people, you know, and people say like, "Oh, he was a dick." Well, when did you walk up to me? You know, yeah. At what point did you walk up to me for me to be that way? What was I doing? What condition was I in? Right. And so, but I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. And that's that's 99 percent of of what people say when I ask them. You know, if I, I hope I was cool. Right. You know, sometimes they just catch me at the wrong time, and I'm in no mood to talk to anyone. Give me five minutes, man. I I haven't even caught my breath from the last song. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, absolutely. I I I feel that uh, through and through. You got to let people be. But um, I, I trust you know trust us. I've never had a bad interaction with you ever. You've always been super cool to me, and I appreciate Good. that. Awesome. Thirtieth um, anniversary of Grip Incorporated. You know, has there ever been a consideration to bring it back, despite you know the passing of Gus and you know, I've I've thought about it, man. You know, I've I've 
hung out with with uh, Valdemar. I've hung out, held out with uh, with Jason uh, Vibrooks, the original uh, bass player. We've talked about it. We've thrown around ideas for vocalists, but man, I just Gus was so special. He had this voice that was just so robust and just and he was like he was he was a punk he was the og punk rockers from england you know during the the height of the punk movement he was several years older than me and uh, he was just a, a, an amazing human being and character and uh, it's difficult for me unless I go to England and I find a replica of, of, of Gus. And, uh, and at that point then maybe I would consider because not, not only was he a fantastic vocalist, but he was a brilliant lyricist and um, his personality and his energy on stage was, un is unlike any other vocalist uh, I've worked with in the past. So you never know but I don't see it happening in the near future. Well, we still have the records to celebrate and uh, congrats yeah. on 30 years later, you know? You know, with, with such a impressive 40 plus year career that you have now and over a hundred records as we, we, you know, spoke about earlier, what is something that you learned about yourself in this life? Uh, that I get, <laughs> that I still get nervous before I go on stage. I still... I have really bad anxiety attacks before I, I go on stage. Uh, my stomach feels like it's be being ripped open. Uh, you know, it's one part butterflies, excitement, anxiousness. And then, you know, you could, uh, you could describe it as being, you know, anxiety or, or nerves. Uh, but it's, it's part of, it's, it's part of that moment going on stage. Uh, I know how to harness it and direct it in the right place. But sometimes I'll sit and, and it's like, I need to lay down. I need to lay on my stomach face down on the bed before show. Like, and, um, and, and just direct it and hold on to all that excitement and anxiety for that moment when you hit the stage. As soon as I hit the stage, I'm behind the drums. As soon as I touch my sticks and touch my drum set, everything goes away. All feelings and, you know, the machine is on. It's I'm ready to go. Um, that's what I've learned. And I, I'm grateful, you know, for my wife to have helped me, like, you know, explain to me, you go through this every time you, this is, this is part, part of it. Just, just relax. <laughs> okay. But I don't show it, you know, but I, I go through it. Everybody, I think everybody goes through it. And if you stop going through it, you should throw in the towel and, you know, retire. Right. Uh, because uh, that's what makes it at least for me, uh, you know, that's part of the excitement part of the thrill you know it's like getting on a roller coaster you have that anxious excitement going on and and uh, all of a sudden the ride happens and you're like Woo you're having a great time uh, so well i think it means that you care you know like that's why it happens. yeah you know? so, yeah oh so i do i hold myself to a certain level and i make sure you know i i try to you know give the best performance i could probably i could possibly give and uh, you know, making sure that all the drum rolls, all the parts are there, all the breaks, and uh, you know, and, it, and if there's ever any time I, you know, I fuck up or miss something, I'm like, damn, you know, I really, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little hard on myself, you know, and I, I kind of like, but then I have the band telling me, you know, I'll apologize, hey, sorry, I missed that break or whatever dude it was great don't worry about it don't worry about it we'll get it tomorrow and um and then it'll go on from there 
Well, I, I, thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's it's amazing to hear, and I think it's an amazing message too for maybe everybody watching this that you know even your heroes and and everybody goes through these feelings, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's normal. It's it's as normal as having good days as well as bad days. Everybody wakes up one day or another, once a week, twice a week, you know, not feeling like, you know, 100% great, you know. So it's, you're on the roller coaster. And I'd rather be on the roller coaster than the merry-go-round, you know. <laughs> I like the excitement of that. <laughs> That is perfectly put, my man. <laughs> well, Dave, thank you so much for hanging with me today. Everybody, check out Rights of Percussion out this May. Uh, it's a killer record. And, Cinco uh, de Mayo. Woo-hoo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tequila shots in its honor. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I'm awesome, going to walk man. around. I'm going to walk around my area with records and a tequila bottle. Yeah, man. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. 